Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Uterine B-Cell Dynamics During Pregnancy, Immune Regulation of the Placenta. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. To learn more, visit them at Beckman.com. Now, we encourage you to participate today by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well, and if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, this presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please follow the process to obtain those credits by clicking on the Continuing Education Credits window. I'd now like to present our speaker, Marilyn Benner, a PhD candidate at Rad Boud Institute of Molecular Life Sciences. Marilyn, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much for this introduction. Welcome everyone to my presentation. I'm glad that I get to tell you some more about the placenta, an organ most people don't like to think too much about. But I want to share with you my conviction that there is a lot to learn from an organ that defines how all of us were born. I'm Marilyn Benner. I'm a PhD candidate of the Reproductive Immunology Group of Dr. van der Molen in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. This webinar was sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences and they hold no responsibility for the, what I will present to you today. I first want to introduce you to the placenta and why to consider its immunity. Reproductive immunology is the field that focuses mainly on immunity of the placenta. And in the following, I want to show you why we do this. So the most prominent function of the placenta that we probably all know is nutrient exchange. So the placenta has to establish this connection of mother and the baby. And aside from this very direct connection, the placenta also offers a safe environment for embryonic and fetal development. So you see here that with its membranes, it kind of forms a cocoon, um, selectively allowing passage of uh, certain factors whilst prohibiting entrance of others. Placenta formation means that fetal cells grow into the uterine wall, and this already sounds quite invasive. So how is this possible? And we look at this in a bit more detail. Cells of fetal origin of this villus tree here of the placenta, they let go, uh, called extra villus trophoblast then, and they can crawl further into the uterine wall. So everything you see here on the right side is maternal tissue, so the ma maternal uterine mucosa, and there are um, uh, spiral arteries, so local vascularization of the mother. And these extra trophoblasts, they settle in the blood vessels here and then allow blood to flow between these villi, so the intervillous space. And whatever nutrients uh, need to be passed onto the baby can then be taken up by, fetal, uh, by the fetal bloodstream. And you see that this invasion of trophoblast cells this connection with the mother is crucial, and otherwise the whole placenta cannot be formed correctly. And for this to happen, uh, you need interaction of fetal and maternal cells. So this is quite complex. So imagine what happens if this vascular connection cannot be established properly. The unborn baby will suffer from nutrient shortage, and uh, thus growth retardation can follow. And this doesn't only affect the baby, but it can also impact health of the mother. It is also the cause of preeclampsia, a common pregnancy complication, which affects quite a high incidence of women worldwide. Preeclampsia, or PE, causes, amongst others, very high blood pressure in the mother and dangerous kidney problems that can lead to lifelong disease or even death. In a severe type of PE, known as HELP syndrome, the liver is also affected. And when PE or help gets severe, doctors are faced with a decision to deliver the baby often too early for the baby's development to be completed uh, in order to save both mother and the baby. 
So you see that there's a lot of impact um, from this process of spiral artery remodeling. So in short, we cannot underestimate the importance of the placenta. However, we have to keep in mind that the fetus is composed for 50% of paternal genes. So here comes why the immunology of the placenta is so important. The question is how local immune cells of the mother allow for invasion and recognition of fetal cells. And we still know very little about um, which cells interact in what way with the fetal cells. So the general quest in reproductive immunology is to understand the mechanisms of regulation that are involved uh, in this placenta formation. How is this um, mismatch between maternal and fetal cells tolerated? It is important to know that the uterus is full of immune cells. And these cells are not generally silenced. For example, they are still able to eradicate incoming pathogens. To understand how this works, we look at these local immune cells by studying their phenotype and also their frequency of different cell types needs to be studied. And ultimately, uh, we want to understand the function of these different immune cells and how they contribute to healthy pregnancy. Only when this is known, we can develop early detection and treatment options. We previously studied uh, the phenotype and composition of immune cells before pregnancy from the non-pregnant endometrium and at the end of pregnancy upon delivery. So by isolating immune cells from menstrual blood, and this is an acknowledged method to obtain lymphocytes from the uterus uh, without the need of a biopsy. So we know that these cells that end up in the menstrual blood uh, represent local cells of the fetal maternal interface, different to systemic cells. And likewise, we isolate cells from the maternal layer of the placenta. So here you see the decidua parietalis that holds the maternal immune cells. And we consider these cells the counterpart to the cells of the endometrium, uh, but then at the end of pregnancy. We study these cells using flow cytometry. So we get an overview of markers that each cell expresses to translate them to a particular cell type. And we observe that while pre-pregnancy, um, so here you see the menstrual blood cells. Um, they're mostly naive T cells. The T cells isolated from placenta, so here in black, contain more memory T cells. So we see an increase in memory towards term. Next to this increase in memory throughout gestation, we could confirm that these T cells increase in general. Uh, while well, NK cells peak mid-gestation. And we know this mostly from studies uh, that focus on a specific cell type or a specific time point as well. So this is a nice confirmation that this parallel approach is a good way to, um, to study this. However, all these studies use different isolation techniques um, and we cannot easily compare percentages of cell types or even marker expression between them. So while we know something from literature what happens in the meantime, uh, it's hard to deduce uh, the dynamics from the different studies. And we don't know when, uh, when induction or inhibition of a particular cell type takes place. And of course, there's a lot that can happen during nine months of pregnancy. And now we only looked at the beginning or at the end. So this leads us to a next question. What happens in the meantime? So based on this, we then moved on to study how the local immune environment is changed throughout gestation. Um, but before moving on to the focus of uh, this presentation and this study, which are B cells, I want to show you something on the general immune composition and how it changes throughout pregnancy. So similar to the approach you just saw. So next to the previously discussed tissue, so from menstrual blood and from term, we isolated cells from the mucosa during pregnancy using abortion material. So using these methods, we can now get meaningful time points all throughout pregnancy, and all of these would otherwise be discarded, all these different types of tissue. So there's a lot to learn without even having to take a biopsy, and we can still look at the local immune environment. So we then characterize uh, the immune cells we isolate from all these different tissue types. Uh, we processed all of them immediate, uh, immediately, and identically. So we performed flow cytometry using standardized panels and uh, we can then focus uh, in more detail 
on the different phenotypes. Again, we confirm these fluctuations you just saw. So for example, in K cells, they rise until mid-gestation and then there's less of them. Uh, for T cells, they are much lower in the beginning of pregnancy and then they increase in frequency during gestation. A small fragmency of these T cells are regulatory T cells or Tregs, regs and they also increase throughout pregnancy. We also looked at the general increase in memory, uh, similar to the approach that you just saw. So you see that from non-pregnant endometrium to first and second trimester and K cells, so here, and K cells rise and then decrease towards birth. T cells rise in frequency from first trimester to term. And Tregs gradually increase during gestation. However, while many studies on immune regulation focus on T cells and their regulatory capacities, the other main cell type to mount an adaptive immune response with possible regulatory capacities has not been characterized throughout gestation. And for the rest of this uh, presentation, I will focus on B cells. So up until now, B cells in the uterus are only considered signs of infection. And our research question was, uh, in how far B cells are naturally part of immunity at the fetal maternal interface. We first used flow cytometry to show that B cells are present in the non-pregnant endometrium uh, and then in placental samples uh, throughout pregnancy. And you see that compared to peripheral blood or even menstrual blood, B cells of the decidua, so that's also what we call the mucosa during pregnancy, the uterine mucosa, sorry, um, there the frequencies of B cells are very low. So this makes it harder to study these cells in vitro and functional assays, but we can zoom in on the different subsets um, by more detailed flow cytometry analysis. And for this, we now move away from supervised gating towards the automated clustering method. So why do we do that? So mostly we, um, we have our flow cytometry plots and we draw gates around our events. But I guess that a lot of you who do this a lot and attend this webinar for this case are familiar with flow cytometry. And that also means that you know that analysis can be a struggle. So um, you can manually define characteristics of a cell type uh, in flow cytometry, and this is based on literature. So you manually draw these gates because of uh, what you read, but also your experience. Uh, you know that in, in a certain plot, uh, your population is always at a, at a certain position. So you draw your gates around them. But of course, this is extremely subjective. And there's also a proportion of chance, right? If you don't copy the gate settings from your previous analysis and you start drawing a gate from scratch, it might just end up at a slightly different position. So it can be a little bit lower or a little bit higher. And the borders change, then also the frequency changes. So in this general example, you see that when a T cell is CD3 positive uh, and CD66 56 negative, uh, we consider it a, yeah, a T cell. But then the question is, would that body be here or like where we draw it now, or maybe slightly higher, maybe slightly angled. And this gets even worse when you don't know what markers to select for. So you're more open in your approach. And if you look for cell types rather than the frequency of a known cell type, so where you um, have an a priori uh, idea about your phenotype. So if you don't have that, if you want to look for something new, then it becomes uh, very hard uh, with this subjective way of gating. And in that case, automated clustering can help to identify which markers cluster together. So imagine I measured expression of marker A, B and C. So in the different channels you have uh, available for your flow cytometry markers. And based on literature, I focus my analysis on cells expressing A and, and B or um, B and C. Unsupervised clustering can identify that when considering all samples of a given, ana uh, given analysis, a group of cells with the same characteristics can be observed. So maybe they express a combination of markers we previously didn't look at. So here, marker A and C, they were not part of our uh, initial question but there's still a possible combination of markers. 
So this is not that big of a problem when we have three markers, so few, and if it's only a question of yes or no expressing that marker, so a very black and white question. However, a cell type can express a marker to different degrees. So maybe a subset of cells is a positive to a low degree for A and um, kind of somewhere in the middle for B and C, and then it has some high expression for A and low degree for B and so on. So um, this is then just a small overview of how from, from these six options you can move to uh, uncountable options uh, because we would not be able to, to differentiate between a certain low and medium or high expression. So um, unsupervised analysis which determines the characteristics of a cell type is especially suited here in, in our question because we don't know if the mucosal cells follow the expression patterns defined um, by, by the use of cells of peripheral blood. So these characteristics that we normally know from literature about a certain cell type, uh, they might not fit with what we know, um, oh sorry, with what we observe in, in uterine cells. So we have to be a bit more open in this approach. Uh, thus to study our mucosal lymphocyte populations we move to an unsupervised clustering method and we use the Citrus tool of the Cytobank website. So we upload all our flow cytometry files and the tool assesses if there are um, different uh, clusters based on the cells from all samples assessed together and it looks then um, to find these clusters uh, themselves of its or itself and you don't select these subsets. The output are these nodes of cells um, expressing a particular marker and um, you then get the overall abundance of this marker um, in the in the data set. So for each uh, each marker you, you're studying you get a different clustering tree. Based on these color codes for all markers, we can then define how each node corresponds to a certain cell type. So this you do manually by um, looking at the different expression patterns. But the nodes and the different subsets, uh, there's nothing manual to, to do that. You just have to then afterwards assess marker expression. And um, yeah, if you want to couple it to a cell type, um, you, you, you draw this, um, these borders. And this strategy showed that samples of uterine mucosa contain B cells. So here you see their characteristic CD19 expression, and they also express HLA-DR. So then uh, the most common classification of B cells is to look at whether they are naive memory or antibody producing. So for this, we first uh, checked with uh, the standardized flow cytometry approach. Now that we've seen that B cells are in, in all of the samples present. Um, here you see that from pre-pregnancy to term, uh, cells become a less naive and more of a switch memory B cell type is observed. You can also see this gain in memory in a CD27 expression. Uh, that's considered a marker that is generally upregulated after B cell activation. And the previous analyses focus on mucosal samples. So we only looked at decidua or the uterine mucosa. And now we want to know what makes these placenta B cells special. Um, so to do that, we have to compare them to peripheral blood. And we need to include B cells of the circulation to do so. So for this comparison, we now move uh, to the unsupervised analysis again, and we can really uh, make most of it where we previously just um, focused on is, is this a conf uh, confirmation? Can we use um, unsupervised analysis to detect these B cells in all of our samples? We can now really harness its power by focusing on phenotypes that we might not see by manual uh, gating. So we don't predefine the marker combinations, but we just ask the algorithm to show us different clusters. And next to this identification of clusters, the Citrus tool also shows clusters that allow for classification. So you can check if a subpopulation is characteristic for one type of sample that you include in your analysis or the other one. So you can first of all examine different phenotypes of marker profiles. We don't know by this unsupervised analysis, but there's also a strength in this analysis by um, already telling you which features of which clusters uh, and subpopulations allow for discriminating between a certain type of sample. 
We observed that there are four clusters of B cells that are absent in peripheral blood, but that can be found in samples of the placenta. So almost nothing here in the peripheral blood samples. But um, more frequencies of these uh, cells uh, during gestation. And it goes a bit far now to describe uh, the different clusters in, in detail, but they show um, phenotypic markers that are associated with regulatory properties. So in the end, um, we, we were wondering, is there a regulatory phenotype involved here? So would these cells um, have some kind of, of, of suppressive function? So these are the profiles of the cell types. Um, and without looking at these histograms of the markers in too much detail, you can appreciate that it's not just about whether or not a marker is present, or that, um, but about the, the slight differences in, in expression. So it's not so much about yes or no, but there can be uh, absence, low, medium or high expression. And we would not have been able to identify these differences based on supervised analysis. So after observing this phenotype that is often um, associated with suppressive capacities, we then moved on to a bit of functional analysis. And we wanted to see if these cells are in fact regulatory. And the most common way for B cells to be a toler tolerogenic regulator is to produce IL-10, an immune suppressive cytokine. And indeed, when we compare peripheral blood and then cells, B cells isolated from uh, decidua, we observe uh, more potent IL-10 production. Next, it would be interesting to know where these cells are located, and then it might also give us a hint on whether this IL-10 has an effect on neighboring cells. Um, but this is very hard to study uh, in, in vitro, so it's, it's very hard for us to isolate enough B cells and to then um, perform co-culture uh, with T cells because of their very low frequencies. But we can study tissue um, in histology and then um, look, at, look at the structure, where do we find these cells. And what you see here is that the CD19 positive B cells here in yellow are located next to T cells, so CD3 positive uh, in red. And you can see some green FOXB3 staining, so every now and then, um, which is characteristic for regulatory T cells. And you can also see that these yellow B cells often cluster together. So they are not really scattered throughout the tissue, um, but uh, in close proxi proximity to T cells. So it would thus be possible for the locally secreted IL-10 to have an effect on the neighboring cells. And here you also see that the NK cells in purple are a lot more abundant. So it's um, really a question of finding the needle in the haystack here that you, you do observe these, uh, these yellow cells, especially that the, because of the B cells uh, clustering together, um, you really have to find the right spot. So where are these clusters um, in, in your whole placenta? You only put quite a small selection of your um, mucosal sample in, on, your, on your slide, so you don't have the whole placenta covered. So there's also a bit of luck involved to, to observe these clusters. For T cells of the placenta, there's already way more evidence that they contribute to healthy pregnancy. So even though you only see very few cells here, very few of these B cells, um, they might still have an effect on these T cells where we know that they are important. So B cells might form an important hub of interaction. And this brings us to our overall conclusion. So even though there's not many of these decidual B cells, that might still contribute to the overall pattern of local immunity and pregnancy. I would like to thank everyone involved in this study. The biggest thanks goes to our donors. More than 200 women helped us out to make this possible. Uh, thanks also to Batman Coulter Life Sciences for sponsoring this webinar. And of course, to, to all the colleagues, all the gynecologists and the uh, contributors from different departments who made this possible. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and now and in the live uh, in the live session, I'm looking forward to interaction and uh, also feel free to get in touch later on. Maybe. So um, maybe.
join the live session now? Can I join the don't live session now? To, uh, but don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. Thank you. And thank you so much, Marilyn, for that informative presentation. Before we begin the Q&A portion of our webinar, I want to encourage all the audience members to participate in the poll that you currently see um, up on your screen. <clears throat> and following this poll, we will begin our live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you wanna ask, please do so now. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. And thanks again for participating in our poll. So let's begin our live Q&A. We have quite a bit of questions already coming in. Our first question, <clears throat> um, Marilyn, is what about IL-10 production by B cells isolated from term issue? So at delivery? Uh, perfect, thanks for that question. Um, just making sure that you can hear me. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, perfect. Uh, all right, so um, yes, we tried looking at IL-10 produced by B cells from TERM. However, the problem with TERM is that you only manage to isolate uh, quite a few cells in general, quite a few lymphocytes, and then the percentage of B cells within that sample is quite low. So in the end, uh, there's unfortunately just a very uh, yeah, low number of cells. So we, we tried to, to look at that, but in the end, we cannot uh, obtain enough events to yeah, consider that a reliable result. So unfortunately, we, we didn't include it um, yeah, because of technical problems as well. But it's also uh, the question then, how relevant are these cells if, um, if we almost find uh, none of them in, anymore at term? Thank you so much. And Marilyn, you didn't know if these women had a healthy pregnancy. Can you still assume that observations are relevant for a healthy pregnancy? Uh, yes, indeed, we don't know that. So unfortunately, there's um, a lot of data we don't have on these women. It's all very uh, anonymous tissue. Um, but uh, we still assume that a large part or the major, uh, the majority of women who donated are healthy. So we um, we do ask questions on, on the health status, and we only ask women to donate for us um, if they um, they. Uh, how do you say that? They, they are not part of the exclusion criteria. So we know that they didn't have infections at the time point or um, any other uh, form of drug abuse or anything that might be a problem for, for us. Thank you so much. Now, one of our audience members has a question about cell isolation. Do you know if cell isolation affects marker expression? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. So I'd encourage anyone who um, does any kind of isolation from tissue to uh, check different enzymes and what they do on your tissue. So we also describe it in the method that we use two different kinds of enzymes depending on what our uh, aim was. So, uh, for example, we use collagenase um, to, to obtain quite some cells from, from a sample and it's very effective to get a lot of cells. Uh, however, it also affects your marker expression. So you have to be careful about that. We then use a different enzyme called Accutase for phenotyping because we see that um, yeah, marker expression isn't affected that much. And yeah, that's pre preliminary, uh, pre sorry, primarily an issue for um, chemokine markers. So it's always good to um, yeah, check what your enzyme does and uh, if um, maybe you need to switch in case you see a large effect or a loss of a certain marker. Thank you so much. Now, our next audience member says, congrats on your excellent presentation. I have two questions, please. Do uterine B cells produce antibodies that enter the system, systemic circulation? Do they contribute to the shift from Th1 to Th2 response in normal pregnancy? Thank you so much for your question as well. Um, so, Yes, these uterine B cells might produce antibodies, and we try to check that. However, um, the the concentration is, is very low, and it, it was a challenge to meta, measure this because also the serum that we culture ourselves in contains uh, yeah, a certain degree of background antibodies. 
So um, unfortunately, I cannot uh, give you um, a very precise answer on this. Um, we, we don't know, but you need to consider that the amount of cells present there is still um, yeah, quite low. So we wouldn't say that they, um, they do that much um, on, on the systemic immunity of the mother probably, but you know, in a personal opinion, I would think that what they do is mainly locally. And uh, I think there was another part of the question con uh, concerning Th1 and Th2 balance. I think that goes a bit in the same direction. So um, probably um, what these B cells might do um, is, is then locally. And um, yeah, there's the, the Th1, Th2 discussion. I think it's both both um, um, yeah discussed systemically or in the uterus. And um, I think the view is, shift is shifting a bit. So it's not only about uh, Th1 or Th2 anymore, but about which cytokines uh, are involved at what time point. Do we really have a lot of information going on? And um, I think we are now more looking into different different cytokines. And if we then look at um, the IL-10 produced by B cells, that might have an effect on um, the cytokine production by the local T cells. So yeah, unfortunately, I also cannot really say for sure what the effect of T cells are at the moment, like I said uh, at the end of the presentation, that would be the next step to um, bring these cells in co-culture and then see if they can really functionally affect T cells. Thanks for the question. And thank you. Now, did you have access to any preeclampsia or other pathological samples? Uh, that's a good question as well. So um, preeclampsia, we um, we did uh, get some term placentas from that. So um, then again, we get the discussion on term placenta. There's way uh, fewer cells we can isolate from that. Um, and at least we could phenotype them and instead of then moving on to the functional assays. However, um, we, we did see a shift in, in phenotype there that looks different from healthy tissue. But then, um, uh, I, I'm not sure if I stressed it in the presentation enough, we um, isolate cells from term from C-sections because then uh, at, we consider that labor hasn't started yet and hasn't had um, a lot of effect on the phenotype uh, of cells we isolate. So um, the preeclampsia placentas we got, often labor was induced or they, uh, they were from uh, normal deliveries. So then um, we checked uh, afterwards that this, um, if this change in profile of B-cells was related to preeclampsia only to the normal delivery uh, instead of um, uh, a C-section. And indeed, in the normal deliveries, we also saw this uh, change in profile. So unfortunately, we couldn't really uh, control for that. We, we couldn't get um, uh, C-section placentas from preeclampsia, or at least not enough to, to really say something about this. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. These are fantastic. Now, do you think that the IL-10 producing B cells migrate to the decidua during gestation or that they differentiate or expand locally? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point to discuss as well. So um, regarding B cells in general, I think there's not quite some evidence that they are present in the uterus independent of and also prior to pregnancy. So um, we can isolate these B cells from menstrual blood, for example, as you've also seen. And there's also um, more data of earlier studies supporting that B cells are a natural component of the mucosal immunity of the uterus. And now there's also quite some studies uh, showing that extra trophoblasts or placental explants can stimulate IL-10 production by B cells. And also, there were some uh, studies showing that CPG uh, can um, stimulate these B cells to produce IL-10. So, if these cells are already present locally, and uh, we know that then um, yeah, we have implantation and extra venous trophoblast invading, we have uh, local exposure to CPG up in pregnancy, there might be a local differentiation going on. So um, yeah, that's also, of course, just speculation, but that's something um, um, yeah, we can envision at the moment. Thank you so much. Our next question, endometrius, plasma cell detection in endometrium is there any relation between detection of B cells and plasma cells? Um, yes. So I think in, in the case of endometritis, we would see way more B cells. And we did have a few samples where the percentage of 
uh, B cells and lymphocytes in general is way too high. So uh, what is way too high uh, is a lot more than uh, what we normally see. Uh, so uh, yeah, after all these isolations of I think now more than 300 percent in the end, you um, you have a feeling of how many cells you you normally get, and if that was um, ab above this usual level, then uh, we didn't consider or we didn't study these cells further, as now we only focus on healthy pregnancy. Thank you very much. Now, Marilyn, have you characterized the expression profile of these IL-10 producing B cells and Based on unsupervised clustering, do these IL-10 plus B cells cluster together as well? Uh, yeah, that would be very interesting. So there are studies from peripheral blood where you can uh, kind of capture the IL-10 on the outside of the cell. And then they, um, uh, earlier studies, did some um, uh, sorting of these cells and also then some analysis. But unfortunately, these um, cells we have now, IL-10 producing B cells, are so few again that we, we couldn't do that for now. Um, but uh, in a future single cell analysis, that would be interesting to uh, yeah, really select only these IL-10 producing cells and then um, yeah, study them in more detail. Now, are the B cells present in the placenta fetal or maternal? And is there immunogenic learning going on within the uterus? Um, okay, so two questions. Um, B cells present in the placenta fetal or maternal. So we uh, right now only isolate the maternal tissue. So we consider what is a continuum kind of from uh, menstrual blood so endometrium samples. Uh, through first and second trimester, we, um, we selected mucosal tissue that we then I think is tissue from the mother and especially with the um, first and second trimester samples. Um, I don't think at that point there's, um, uh, or the, sorry, the fetal membranes didn't fuse with the maternal membranes yet. So whatever we have at that point uh, is really maternal. And also for term samples, we do select only the sidra parietalis, so the maternal layer of the placenta. Um, is there uh, immunogenic learning? Uh, I think that's um, that's an interesting point, and that also our group focuses on, um, especially now for NK cells. And um, yeah, we, we we didn't look at that for for B cells until now, so it would be interesting to then uh, follow up um, B cells, maybe from menstrual blood samples of women who have been pregnant, and then later on check if their B cell profile uh, is, is different because they have been pregnant before. And um, yeah, maybe this kind of fades out at some point as well. And uh, yeah, we don't know. So in the end, it might be interesting to see if uh, locally there's some kind of memory of these B cells as well. Thank you so much. And we have time for a few more questions. What role do NK cells play? And this is a two-part question. Does the fetus have NK cells sometimes in development? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, work done on NK cells, and they're the most prominent cell type uh, in these decidual samples. So um, I think I can uh, refer, if you want, I can somehow send around um, some uh, great reviews on that. I'm not an NK cell expert, um, but there's um, yeah a lot of um, a lot more studies on NK cells, and that's also uh, kind of uh, why we focus now on these B cells because. And K cells and T cells are such a big focus, but um, it might also be this very small population of cells that, that still contributes. Um, and does the fetus have NK cells? Um, I, I think this is also um, yeah, a, a different part of the discussion. So if you want to look at uh, NK cells, there's, there's a lot of great work out there. And um, yeah, that's really uh, uh, yeah, the, the biggest, uh, the biggest amount of information you will find on reproductive immunology. So, um, yeah, maybe, I don't know if there's some way I can uh, distribute it, but uh, otherwise, yeah, feel free to get in touch, and uh, um, I, I'll refer to you uh, work from people who really know a lot about NK cells. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have time for two more questions. How do you know that you look at uterine cells and not contamination by peripheral blood? Uh, yeah, that's uh, a good question that we often get asked because, um, yeah, it is um, uh, it is an important uh, thing to consider. We 
did check this especially for our NKSAs as well because there um, we we have some markers like CD103 where we know that they are um, then considered tissue resident cells or if they lack um, CD62L they are not associated with a circulating lymphocytes. So uh, we, we did check these markers for NK cells so that we know that um, even for these big cell populations there is no contamination. For B cells there is um, not that much strong uh, marker profiles where we can really say okay if the cell expresses these markers, we can consider them a tissue resident cell. But there's now some studies um, focusing on, I think, gut resident B cells who um, set up kind of a marker profile to check if a cell is resident. Um, however, however, then we also wouldn't know for sure if the same marker profiles would be seen in uterine B cells. So um, I think also the, um, uh, the unsupervised analysis you saw was the biggest uh, evidence now that um, the cells we isolate from uterine mucosa are really typically distinct to or distinct from peripheral blood. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And we have one final question for you. Why did you choose to study B cells and not other types of immune system cells? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think we, we just discussed that a little bit, um, basically because there's not a lot of information about that, and um, it might still be important. So it's a bit overlooked, and the most information we see on, uh, not the most information, but a lot of information uh, still says that um, presence of B cells is pathological. And we just wanted to see uh, if, if this is really the case, um, or if we if we do see B cells in all our samples, if we do. So uh, it would be um, uh, nice to, to just include them a bit more in the discussion. Um, and like we said, there's now a lot of evidence on K cells and T cells, and that's a strong focus. But um, yeah, maybe even though it's just so few numbers, these B cells do contribute to the overall immune environment. So uh, yeah, it was uh, um, venturing into a new cell type, kind of. Marilyn, I want to thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. And would you like to provide any closing remarks before we go? Uh, no, thank you. This was uh, really nice. There was a lot of discussion. I received a lot of questions. And if there's anything else, uh, you can uh, contact me. I think my email address is visible somewhere. So feel free to get in touch. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you again, Marilyn, for your time and for your important research. And I want to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. Labrids will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay safe and stay healthy. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.